So it's a great pleasure to have here Professor Eberhard Bodenschatz from uh, Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. So very brief uh, review of his career. He studied physics in Bayreuth, Northern Bavaria, and he received his PhD in theoretical physics there. And then he turned to become an experimental physicist uh, studying turbulence as a postdoc in the University of California, Santa Barbara, and later since 1992 as professor at Cornell University. Then in 2003, he returned to Germany to become director of the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization in Göttingen. And there he studied a very wide range of topics related to turbulence and the uh, fundamental physics of it and effects on cloud formation and different applications. And if I would continue listing his numerous recognitions, this would probably exhaust the entire colloquium time slot. So I will leave the stage to Professor Bodenschatz, who will speak about human droplets and aerosols. And a technical remark, this is a very, presently a very hot topic for the same reason as we cannot organize it in a usual format in the chat amphitheater. Instead, it's a webinar, and uh, if you have any questions, please ask them during or after the presentation via the Q&A panel, and we will then moderate, invite you to ask it or ask it directly. So, please, Professor Wunschatz, it's your yeah, turn. So, so, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, to give you this talk. Uh, of course, it's a pity that I couldn't come and visit. I would have surely enjoyed the food, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so, yesterday I watched the movie, and there was some pizza, and I just couldn't. I said, how can I have not had an Italian pizza for so long? It was really hard, I mean, to watch this movie. Uh, I would never have thought that this pandemic does do, does do that to you. Okay, so I'm talking about human droplets and aerosols. I'm, I'm trying to give you an overview of, of something we have been working on for, let's say, almost a year now, a little, basically almost a little longer than a year, basically since it started. And I try to give you an overview of, you know, what this means, what really is happening, what are these droplets and aerosols? Where do they come from? Where do they go? How can we avoid breathing them? And so on. And so it's, it's kind of, it tries to give a real basic overview also on masks. And I have decided today not to talk about music instruments uh, because I wanted to show you some other things, but we also work on music instruments. And so, so let, me go to the, let me go to the next slide. So I guess I have to go here like this. So these are the, this is out of a review. By the way, these QR codes, if you take a picture, you get to this review at archive. We just put it out there. Amira Pölker is the first author of this uh, study. There's a lot of authors. And so what happens is we have these aerosols. So these, as you can see here, these people are putting out, or these, these puppets are putting out aerosols and droplets. And uh, as you will see, these, the, the difference is actually very simple. The very small droplets become aerosols because they dry quickly, while the big droplets fall to the ground relatively rapidly and dry then on the ground and not in the air, and therefore don't stay airborne. But And so you have the so-called formite route, which means a droplet hits, for example, the suitcase, and then you touch that suitcase, and then you put this hand in your mouth, and then you might catch the virus. Or you actually get one of these droplets, you inhale it, which is even worse, much worse than, than uh, having it through your hand or you actually have these aerosols which try on being carried by the wind. Now, the interesting part about the, this, these aerosols is of course, they are non-local. This means that these, these, like smoke, they stay in the air. Actually, smoke is a very good example of this, or I also use sometimes the smell of perfume or the smell of uh, uh, you know, shaving, shaving cream or something. And so anytime you have something that smells and it comes from a person, that's basically also tells you that the aerosols of this person might also reach you through the breathing. And so you have this exposure, which can go for over very long distances. And of course, we, we know that you to, to get sick, you need a certain dose, which, which is done biologically. And so once you have this dose, then it's more likely that you get infected. And I wanted to talk about all this. And with this, I chose my next slide here, which shows you that, of course, fluid dynamics and fluid flows and fluid physics is very important. I personally am a big fan of the word fluid physics because fluid mechanics and fluid sounds like engineering. Well, it's really not engineering, it's really physics. It's about how fluids behave. So, because here we also have to deal with evaporation, condensation, drying, uh, different constitu uh, constituents. Um, and then, for example, in the hospital, you have an isolation room. So you have a filter that sucks off the air. You have some air coming in from above, for example. And then, of course, you have mixing in the room. And at the same time, people are moving around. So you get bake flow behind a person, or for example, you could open the door and 
in this case, what they make is they make this ante room because what happens is when you open a door, you pump about four cubic meters of air just by opening the door and closing the door. So it's a lot of air that you're actually pumping in and out of a room. And so they make a second room so that where the one door is closed and the other one is open so that you actually stop this airflow as much as possible. And then you have a strong airflow, which is supposed to clean the air before the next door opens. And so this is why you do. And then of course you have a thermal plume. And on the right side in this picture, I actually show you a picture of a thermal plume over subject number one, that's me. And you can see that the air is clearly rising. So we put in a, in a lecture hall, you put in some discotheque smoke and then you just sit there and you have the ventilation on and the clean air is coming to your feet because it's displacement ventilation and it's cold and your body takes this air, heats it up and it rises along your body. And here you can see this thermal plume. You see it's free of aerosols which were in the room. So you can see very nicely what's shown here as this, this body thermal plume here in this, in this picture. Uh, also these, the references as you can see are from 2016. So this is nothing new really. This is something we know for a very, very long time. And with the advent of the pandemics, it was a little bit surprising that we seem to have forgotten all these things, although they were in the literature. Um, it turns out that in about the late 90s, early 90s, a lot of faculties on bioaerosols and aerosols have been closed and shut down. So the, the, what that means is the academia was kind of empty. Industry was, people were there, but not in academia anymore, because by some reason we have decided we have under everything understood and it would for, was forgotten that, of course, you need also young people who carry this information into the future. And so if you don't educate anybody very thoroughly on this topic anymore, then because the faculties that do research are missing and then the topic gets a little bit forgotten. And it turns out that most of the lead research on this was done from the late, from the middle 90s to now was done not in Europe, not in Germany. It was done mostly in China and a lot in Australia because they happen to be a very, very powerful uh, scientist. But, but somehow the, the knowledge was, was gone, was moved to industry. And, and so the basic sciences was not that present. So I hope that this pandemic causes us to rethink. Um, I should also mention at this point, why is this pandemic? Why do we expect more pandemics to happen? It's, it's actually quite simple. We have never been as mobile as of now. I mean, right now we are not very mobile, but uh, as soon as the pandemic is gone, we will be extremely mobile again. So we have never been that mobile. We have never had so many human beings on the earth, never. And so this means we have now many, many examples where something can go wrong in biology and with pathogens and so on and so on. So these are the two things, right? So before the population density was lower, they, you weren't so mobile, so it was much easier to contain a, a disease in a local area and it would spread much, much, much slower and would not immediately become global as happened in this case. And um, in some sense, we are a little bit lucky because so far this virus is relatively harmless. Uh, you need a relatively large dose to get infected. Uh, if it would be measles, we would be really in doo-doo. Uh, measles had a, a, has an R of about 34 compared to four, right? So that's a huge difference in, in the reproduction rate. And so, so in some sense, we're a little bit lucky, although the new mutations seem to get a little scary, especially the one from Brazil. Nobody really knows how bad it is, but uh, we will see. Okay, so let me go on. So here I'm sitting in a lecture hall and in here I was, was what I'm doing is I'm, shout, I'm shouting. So, so in German, we say Tor, goal, right? You can see the air going forward here. You see that? Uh, three lines. <coughs> now I'm coughing and you can see it here. Then you can see the vortex here. Here it goes. You see, and now what happens, you're actually pushing the room. So this room is a typical lecture hall, right? So this is ventilated, you can see in the clear air coming in from below, but I can easily reach with my cough about three, four, four, four benches. And here I did tour again. And so, of course, these are the, these are the activities which are, which, are the, which are the worst. So where do these aerosols actually that I exhale come from? So what you saw there were not the aerosols in the room. These were the aerosols I put in the room to see where the cleaner air, which comes out of my face, out, out of the lung, which has been freshly cleaned, is actually going out and you can't see this little tiny droplets you can't see. And so how does it happen? Well, there's many ways to do that. So we have here, you see a typical human being. And so what you have is let's start down here. So there's the bronchioles. There's about 30,000 terminal bronchioles in our lungs. And these are very, very, uh, very thin tubings of about half a millimeter in diameter and a little smaller. And after that, there come the alveoles where basically the air exchange is done. And so what happens is when we exhale, these bronchioles collapse 
because we are exhale, we are basically ex ex exhaling. And then when we inhale, they pop open again. And when we exhale, why? Because they have been popping open. There's a fluid film being generated, and this fluid film bursts, and this fluid film then is carried through the lung, and we have very very small aerosols. Another uh, reason to get aerosols in the air is by shear, of course, in the like in the in in the in, in here in this region of, of our uh, uh, bronch, bronchian, and then of course you have also the mouth. But I will talk about this a little more. So so what that means, you have for example, you have this tidal breeze here. This is the volume plotted as against as time. Then you do a very strong inhalation. Then the bronchioles uh, deep exhalation. The bronchioles close, and then the bronchioles open. And then you do a, do a deep uh, inhalation, of course, and everything widens, and then you, you breathe out again. This is out of the review. Up here is the link to our review that we just put up on archive. And not Met Archive, but Archive, because I'm a big fan of Archive. And so, um, but if you have these aerosols, where do they go? And so the question is now, you have to look at the other situation. So this is the situation. The first video was the situation where, I mean, this first picture was the situation where I asked myself, where do they come from? But now we have to ask, where do they go to in case I inhale these aerosols or dust or small things? And what happens is you have different mechanisms. So you have so-called so inertial impaction, which means these particles are much, much bigger and very heavy compared to the air that they're surrounded by. So they have a lot of inertial dynamics. So they don't go around corners. They don't like to go around corners. The fluid goes around the corner, but the particle just keeps going straight and hits the wall and just deposits there. Then you have sedimentation where the particles are heavier and they try to settle because of gravity. But then you also have diffusion and they just stick by diffusion. And interestingly is that there's just as it is for masks at about 300 nanometer particle size, as I will show in a moment. Also the lung has a hole in absorption. So in other words, where masks have a problem to filter, our face masks like this here, right? Where they have a problem to filter, also our lung has a problem to filter. That's good news in some sense, because it helps us, of course, to, you don't need a mask that completely filters at 300 nanometers because the lung is also very inefficient at 300 nanometers to, to deposit the particles. So we know from COVID-19, we know that the from the SARS-CoV, we know that the, the a lot of viruses probably get attached up here or here in this region of the throat. Uh, it, they, but they could also go very deep into the lung because they are viral laden aerosols, which then will actually deposit down deep in the lung. So down here, we typically have the so-called 2.5 2 particle uh, micrometer diameter. Those particles will make it into the lung, while particles that are bigger than 2.5 typically 2.5 microns will not be going down into the lung. And so I want to talk about four topics. The first one is drops and aerosols. The second topic is about, can we actually calculate the risk? Can we estimate the risk? Then I talk a little bit uh, about the mask. I will not talk about the trumpet because I said I just won't do that. But if you have somebody ask, I can show something. And then I talk about cleaning the air because right now we would like to open schools and would like to open offices. And you know we would like all to come back and actually have a seminar in person and not a seminar on, on Zoom. And so uh, I will talk about all this. So this is subject number one. You can see me here. And I'm exhaling some test smoke, which came out of this little machine here that you can perhaps see in the video. And so this is a high speed video. You see the seconds go by, the milliseconds go by up here. And I'm shouting, obviously, Tor. Uh, I said, Tor, uh, basically, I was starting to talk about Tor, and then suddenly it came out. By the way, interesting, you might notice that. The, the smoke comes out at an angle to me. That's very typical. I don't know why, but we humans seem not to breathe out straight. We always breathe out mostly at an angle. So I didn't know why, but this is how it is. That it's, and it's downward as an angle of about 30 degrees. I will talk about this. Now, what we can do is we can take some machinery, which I explain in a moment, and take some high-speed images of actually real droplets that are coming, aerosols that are coming out of our mouth. So you take a high-speed video camera, you take a 300 watt pulse laser, and uh, then you make sure you don't burn out, you don't burn the skin or you don't burn the eyesight. And then you do this experiment. And then what you see here are basically 2000 images overlaid on top of each other. This is about uh, something like uh, 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 one second. So this is a quite a long period. And the person, which was me, has the nose here, the mouth there, and I'm just singing happy birthday, for example. 
And then what you see, the fluid dynamics is very interesting. You see some big particles, boom, 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 boom. They, they fly straight. These are these inertial particles. And then you see a lot of small stuff in here that just seems to do whatever it does in this turbulent flow. And they will just enrich basically the air and will stay in the air as aerosols. And so but what you also see here is nowhere in this picture is a virus, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> there might be some bacteria from my mouth, but uh, I had no COVID-19 on that day. So the so you see also it's very highly turbulent. You see there's structures, there's vortices. So I like this picture a lot. It looks a little bit like Leonardo da Vinci of the waterfall drawing of turbulence, but in this way, it's just you breathing or me breathing out or saying something, that's all. But right now, if I would have a camera here, would take a picture about right here in front of my face, right there, this would look just like that. So it's right now raining down on my keyboard, by the way. So. Um, you, you can easily visualize that if the sun is out, you can just, you can do this at home with your kids. It's, it's not hard. You just take a little iPhone uh, or a camera with a slow motion and just take a video when the sun is shining at your face and then forward scattering, you can just see the big particles, no problem. And so you can do a lot of these things just at home. So this is a very nice paper from Howard Stone at Princeton and colleagues. And so what you see here is what happens. This is one mode of particle generation, which is at the lips. So if you, for example, say a P, like on the right side, I play this video again. So here you see you there are this the, the, the saliva is viscoelastic, so it makes these trips. So this is high speed videos. You see 16.2 milliseconds. So this is very fast. And then it makes these trips and then these trips form a, a, a basically tear and they make droplets. I can play this again. So here you see them going. You have to get used a little bit to this because usually we, we look at lips in a different way. We don't quite do this kind of imaging. Um, it might be, it looks a little disturbing, but that's what it is, right? I mean, that's what we are doing. And so what, what is actually inside of these droplets, right? So, we're, so we have showed you these big, huge, gigantic droplets, but there's also very small droplets. And what you have is basically, you have the fluid from the lung or you have saliva. So these are the two main components and the fluid in the lung might also have different constitution because for example, in the, in the in the, uh, in, 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 in the bronchians, and what you what you have there is you have a lot of mucus, because this is where the cilia, these little the 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 the, the cells that basically have little hairs, make sure that all the dirt you breathe all day long is being put out over your vocal cords into the esophagus. So you actually per day you are taking up about three milliliters of fluid is being pumped out of your lung and flows down your esophagus. So usually we don't know because we don't worry, right? That there's so much fluid, you know, like a little schnapps glass full of, of fluid is being actually pumped all the time over your focal cords. At night, probably it's different, but during the day, it's probably just like that. And then you have either one pathogen in there or you could have multiple pathogens, but you could also have droplets that have nothing. And these droplets, of course, are made out of, out of salt and uh, salts, proteins, uh, surfactants, all kinds of very interesting things. And we actually now have a, a project with uh, Christopher Pölker from the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry. And we, he just came back from BESI, from BESI 2, from the beam line. And he's done uh, basically X-ray scattering, all kinds of scattering of real human aerosols to see what's in them. And there are some surprises. It's, it's, it's different from what we expected. We don't know yet. There was only one week, right? So you know what one week is. doesn't mean you really have, they're still analyzing data. And so this is very, very interesting. You can actually do very good studies on these, on these, on these droplets. You just have to make sure you catch them. So this is for that we have a special technique which works very well. And so what you can also do is you can make a surrogate material. By now we also have pictures of real, uh, of real uh, aerosols, but these were just surrogate materials where we used basic sodium chloride and water and just see what do you get. Well, what you get is you get particles like this. So this is a particle which was in the air, which settled down. So this is just a, basically a dried salt crystal in this case. The water is gone. You can see the you can see the BCC structure here. You can see there must be where FCC. I mean, it, it definitely something with the right angle. And then this is basically what happens here: is a droplet was hitting the surface and then was drying. And then you get these structures. You can do this with, with electron microscopy. You can look at these things with Raman. You can analyze what is the what are the constituents in there. You can actually find out what is the biological structure of these of these objects. And this is what we are getting at right now, together also with this Institute, Institute with uh, Christiansen at, at Forchheim. And so what do you have as well? So depending on relative humidity, you have a, of course, a liquid phase because when it's very liquid at 100% humidity, these droplets just stay liquid. 
But then if it gets drier, they start to dry. It gets, gives you a semi-solid phase and then finally a solid phase. And on the right side out of this review that I had pointed out at the beginning, it tells you what might actually be in there. And these are all the literatures that say what is in saliva, what is in, in, in uh, airway surface fluid, which is this ELF here. And so you can, you can study this and you can try to understand it better. And so what we did is we took just some airway surface fluid, which was taken from a patient. So when patients are sick, they have to pump off the liquid and uh, in the emergency room and we, we got a lot of it. <laughs> it's actually not that pretty, to be honest. I hope they would just give me a little while, but they gave me a half a liter. So it was kind of an interesting, uh, but it's biologically checked, so you can't get infected and so on. I mean, the, the meds are really good, right? I mean, they, they don't give you something that's dangerous. They just give you something that looks like it's, well, it's from a human. And so what, what here, what we did is, so Jan Muller check, he, he basically took a wire and said, but if I put these droplets on a wire, how do they drop? And then he can take a shadow imaging and you can see how they, how they initially draw dry like a normal droplet would do. But then suddenly you see them wrinkle up and do all kinds of interesting stuff. That's basically where the surfactants and the salt crystals will start to become in. So here you have a salt gel transition. So you go to a gel and then finally you just have very slow diffusion out through this almost solid, solid material. And that depends of course at the humidity in the room. This was at a humidity of about 30, 30%. Here is actually a plot. So this is a time evolution. And from this, you can then measure how fast does one of these AV service fluids and saliva dry. So this is saliva of the drinking. Saliva with no drinking is purple and airway surface fluid is this blue stuff, right? So, so what you notice, by the way, you see when you drink, you dissolve the salts in the, in the, and, the, and the, the proteins and everything, and so the material is cleaner. So what that means, it drinks much more, of course, than if you use your normal saliva. This probably also depends how dry your mouth is, whether you have been talking like me right now, where the saliva is probably kind of dry, uh, but it depends on a lot of factors. And so this is very important. Why is this important, by the way? Well, in aerosols, what we are worrying about is an infectious dose. We don't worry about so much about, you know, that they're droplets. We are, we are worrying about the infection dose that I might inhale. That, how many viruses I might inhale hangs up from the volume that is in the air. It's not the number density, it's the volume density. In other words, what volume particles are in the air, and those particles will then dry. And it's the wet volume that counts because all the virions were going into these droplets in the wet state and not in the dry state, of course. And so what that means is you have to worry about the volume. And this is why you would have to just imagine what the volume difference, it will go like R cubed, right? So it's a huge effect. So if you have a particle that's 10 microns or a particle that's 300 nanometers. And if you assume that you have a certain concentration of virions in average per milliliter, liquid, which is roughly, by the way, 10 to the eight virions per milliliter, then you realize if I have a 300 nanometer, one 300 nanometer drop, the likelihood, of course, to catch one virion is much lower than if I have a drop, which is one millimeter or two millimeters. Makes sense. So you might actually, with one two millimeter drop, you might get sick, while with the other ones, you can have millions before you even notice any difference, before you can get a, the right dose that you want that you need to get sick uh, or not want to have to get sick. Let's put it this way. And so what we did is, so end of March, we started measuring, you know, we, I was managing director. So the first thing we did is, you know, I had to put up some signs saying, you know, keep calm and carry on. Um, and then we, we made some measurements of the efficiency of masks. Okay, I, I stopped there. So what we what we tried to do, so there was this initiative in Stanford where they wanted to make masks for medical personnel, which, because there were no masks anymore, right? Nobody could protect themselves anymore. And so they came up with this idea, why not use a diverse mask? And we started out the same way. And this, this video here in the middle, it was exactly that try for me. I used the vacuum cleaner. I used actually the filter of my vacuum cleaner at home, which is one of these kitchen, you know, the ones that drive around in the house. Uh, well, it worked all very well, just the filter was really poor. I mean, it was, I, I, right now I'm, I put a different filter into this vacuum cleaner because the filter was so poor, it wouldn't actually, well, it keeps the big dust out, but not the fine dust. And so this worked, but then we had this great idea and said, well, why don't we, I think it's great. We said, why don't we build, use the same technique, 
to measure aerosols. Why don't we make a clean room that a person can wear so we don't have to go in a clean room? The, the aerosols that you measure are much, much less than in the, in the air outside, much, much less, orders of magnitude less. And so you need a clean room. You cannot measure human aerosols without a clean room, but you can make a private clean room, which I have here on my face, by basically separating the inlet air. The inlet air comes through here. There's valves here and there. So the air is being sucked in. And then there is backup valves, which close. So these valves close when I exhale. And the air goes out through a little channel here on the side and then go up into this volume here, to the upper volume, and then get carried away through this filter. So this has the advantage. I cannot infect anybody. I have a, a clean environment. And the nice part is also because of all these valves that are in here, I can make sure that I'm measuring mostly on exhale only. I don't measure actually on inhale much at all because the valves are closed when I'm inhaling. There's only this little volume here, but if you make up here a large enough backup volume, what that means is when you exhale, initially there's a tiny bit of, of mixed air with fresh air going out, but the rest is then pure exhale. And this instrument here is that you see here, this is an SMPS and an OPS. So one uses me scattering, the other one does a, a discharge and then charges the particles to measure down to 10 nanometers. So this measures to 10 nanometers. This guy here measures from about 250 nanometers up to five microns. By, by me scattering. And if you just take this out here, they suck, each one of them takes about a liter per minute. And so when you, when you, when you suck this air out, you just, all you have to make sure is that the volume out here doesn't run empty in the moment you don't do anything. And this way you can actually measure continuously the aerosol intake. And thanks to 3D printing nowadays, you can just print your own adapters in no time and you can, you can really do amazing things. And this is our little trick. By now we use a different mask. This mask was very good because you, this had silicone and you can hear people. The solid masks you can barely hear. And, but it was very uncomfortable because the silicon was pushing at the mouth. It was not so great, but we, 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 we. So here you see what then opera singers do when you make a test with opera singers. So by the, by the way, this is, I should say this is, I, I, I still have the key goosebumps right now. Uh, I should say that when you're standing next to an opera singer in about a half a meter distance and they sing, I get goosebumps. I mean, heavy goosebumps because it's unbelievable when you stand next, next to her. Uh, you know, when you sit in the publicum or when you sit further back, it's not quite the same impression that standing next to them. Uh, so I had the clay pressure of working with quite a few uh, opera singers in the opera house itself. And what you can see here is we have two of these OPSs here. So we measure only big particles and we tried, we will measure one wet. And then, so we had here this Y and so we measure wet and dry. So we measure dry aerosols because as I told you, we need to know what the volume is when it's dry. And the problem is on the way to the instrument, the small droplets will already dry away. And so most measurements that have been done before us, they actually have a mixture of wet and dry. While we have now all dry measurements and then we have to worry about how much does it actually dry and in the, when you would have, if you watched very carefully what I was showing before, it's a roughly a factor of 4.6. This is what we have measured. So there's a, there's a rough factor of 4.6 in diameter or in radius from wet to dry. That's very important because if you want to calculate the risk, you have to know what, what is the dry volume and then you have to calculate back on the wet volume. And that tells you how many virions might actually have been in these aerosols. And then, of course, we didn't trust this measurement. We, we said, well, you know, the mask is, leak, is not leak tight. And it's really true. It's not 100% leak tight, of course. And you can see the background a little bit when you're only breathing. Because breathing, you put out very little particles. Singing is no problem whatsoever. It overrides everything. Uh, you get a factor 20 more particles. And that's enough to see the particles. Or shouting is even more efficient. Uh, coughing is also very efficient. But coughing for one minute is actually really tiring. Uh, so very few people actually cough for so long. And so what we did is, you see, we went to our really nice clean room. It's very clean, by the way. It's, we have 100 particles per, 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 per cubic meter. So I mean, it's really clean. It's very, very nice. And so then, then we use this technique. And then we use the traditional technique, which is you just take a, a funnel and you shout into a funnel. And it turned out this measurement and this measurement was very valuable because we can match them up to each other and see which one has what systematic errors and so on and so on. And then, of course, we had also an opera singer. So here. Oh, 
So we have we have all we all have all classes of singers, by the way. Uh, we also may, measured one ballet ballet dancer. So one ballet dancer. It turns out these instruments are so light you can put them in a backpack, and then you can actually go ballet dancing. And 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 she succeeded, and she didn't. And she's. I mean, it's hard to breathe through these filters. By the way, it's not the same as you breathe through the normal system. That's why also the funnel is so important because the funnel is just straight out, right? There's nothing in the way. There's no extra flow impedance. But we have measured also ballet dancers, so we could measure a sports person in the gym or something. We haven't done that yet, but we could easily do that with this mask. Well, and then we remembered, of course, we do usually measurements in clouds and we measure particles in clouds. And we had this instrument, Holo Holo. We have actually our own holography system. And so this is an inline holography system that allows you to measure particles in 3D, the location and the shape from five microns to about a millimeter, no problem. Now, of course, uh, human aerosols are boring because they're all browned. Very rarely you see something that looks like a fiber because there's some dirt in the air, but usually it's round. And so what we did is we took this, not on the airplane, of course, we put it in our clean room. You, here you see the setup. So here's the Halo Holo system, which is just inline holography. So you have one camera, you make a light scattering image, you know you have a coherent light beam and then you can calculate back what the particles might have been that made that scattering picture. And so what you then have is you have this funnel here to measure the aerosols at the same time. And then we were just speaking in there and then we get this. The acoustics in the clean room is really bad. So we also measured, if you look here, we also measured humidity here. So this is a humidity sensor that we knew what the humidity is. What we have not measured yet is the volume that comes out. We have measured also velocities, but it's, uh, you need an extra spirometer to measure. Basically, it's very hard to do it while singing, by the way, to really measure this. But what we can do is the following. So here, this is normal reading, for example. So what the hologram does is basically, when you, when you look at this picture here, you have about a 20 centimeter light path here. And the diameter that you see is about is about one centimeter, so it's actually square because your camera is has pixels, right? And so, so this is a, this is this volume. It's about a centimeter by a centimeter by about fourteen centimeters, and this is what you typically see. I marked here what would fall to the ground and what would stay in the air. Uh, so this falls to the ground most likely. This would stay in the air, and you can see normal reading is very low. Then stage reading means you're leading route. You're trying to talk to an audience, and then of course shouting tour is really quite something. Uh, you can also see, that's just one of the images. By the way, that instrument only does six pictures per second, so it's not really that great. The new one that we have does 75 pictures per second, it's better. But then the computation of time is outrageous. To, to invert these scattering images back to, uh, under the assumption that it's a hologram actually takes quite some time. And so what you see here is there's one big gigantic particle, 120 microns, but we even see up to one millimeter. And so then we had another piece of equipment on the Zugspitze. So Zugspitze, as you might know, Germany got a mountain from the, from the Austrian king. Uh, Bavaria got this mountain and we own half of it. They did, he didn't even give us the whole mountain. He only gave us half of the mountain, but we got the top, okay? And of course the top had to be five meters short of 3000 meters or six meters, I forgot. So it's not a 3000 meter mountain. It's almost 3000 meter mountain. And we do usually cloud physics experiments up there. So we would like to do droplet imaging. We like to measure droplet dynamics in clouds because we would like to understand why it rains so quickly. This is still not understood in, in wet clouds. There's a group, for example, also at ETH. They also have a balloon like ours, but we also do stationary measurements. This is the sled where we drive with the wind. And this is the experiment that's up there. It's a camera box where we do actually three-dimensional imaging with about 15,000 pictures per second. We have a very bright laser beam that shines downward towards the cameras, the optics in, in there. You see there's a lot of springs and stuff because it's very hard to decouple the motion from the vibrations of the cameras and so on and so on. And so let me show you here. So what you see here is this is Jan Molacek, which is he's very proud as you can see. And he should be proud by the way, I will explain in a moment. And so what you see here is this is our 300 watt laser coming down. You see the green light up here, it comes down and then we look in forward scattering at about 30 degree angle with three cameras. And then we do three dimensional particle tracking with, with, with clever boxes. By the way, here in the background, you see an ultrasonic velocity measurement device that measures the velocity of, of the shot. So here's a picture. So here you see a cloud on Zugspitze. You see the cloud droplets. This is a real cloud. This is not somebody shouting, okay? So this is a cloud. By the way, human experiments are much, much, much easier. 
because it's very easy to bring a person up to this instrument and to shout. Waiting for the cloud is a different story because sometimes you sit up there and there's only sunshine, day in, day out. I mean, you must have been in the mountains, so you know. So we want the clouds, right? We want the stuff that the other people don't want, right? So we, we usually want the bad weather. And so, but they were lucky, as you can see, we have tons of data, we have terabytes of data. Here you see the optical, here you see the optical setup here. So these are these high-speed video cameras that are mounted in there. And so this is actually on the mountain, as you can see back here, they had it on the crane. But then we put this in Göttingen into the lab and you know, it's winter, nobody is allowed with Corona to be on the mountain. It's all outlawed. And so we did actually measurements. So here, what this is me basically speaking into the instrument. Of course, I had goggles on so that I wouldn't burn out my eyesight and I wouldn't burn my skin. Every day was a, a little bar that made sure I wouldn't go too far. And then you would speak. And then we had this mirror camera, which was taking these images that I showed you a, a moment ago, where these, these overlays were there. And so what we then can do is we can do particle tracking. And the one part that, that Jan can, and, and Gus Bertens can really be proud about is they can calculate out of the three-dimensional imaging under the assumption that these are drops with me scattering and out of focus imaging the size of the particles. So not only can we image 15,000 particles, 15,000 pictures per second, but also can we estimate how big the particles are. So we get the velocity, for example, here, the velocity is color scaled from 0.3 meters per second, 0.2 meters per second to 13 meters per second. We have measured events of up to 70 meters per second. So when you speak, you drop it out drops that go out with 70 meters per second. It's pretty astounding. And simultaneously, we did this mirror imaging, which you see here. So here is the same image, by the way. So here, this is the part that the camera, this right picture sees. And the other one is the one with this mirror camera that I've shown you before. So here's, by the way, the nose. You can actually see the nose here. Of the, of the person who was actually speaking at the moment. So what that means is we have a very good idea what the jet is. We know about the turbulence of the jet. We know about the velocity. We know about the angle of the jet. And so we can analyze this, for example, here. So this is two-dimensional Lagrangian particle tracking. The person is saying once upon a time. So again, the person is, the nose is here, right? The nose is here, mouse is there, upon. There we go. And so this, this is what makes your iPhone dirty when you, or your, your, your cell phone when you, when, you, when you speak with the loudspeaker on and then you look at the surface, you say, God, is this dirty? This is, by the way, these particles were measured in the 40s. And the measurement is really good, I should say. So Dugoit, who did this in the 40s, he did amazing measurements with the class. He looked at the impacts and he measured them with a the microscope and he did really well. I mean, really well. And so, so this, you see also the milliseconds go by now. Of course, these are only the big particles. So these are not the small particles. And the color is, by the way, the velocity going up to 10.9 meters per second. So we now have lots of this data. So we can look at uh, how this looks. So this is the 3D particle tracking. Here is everything put on top of each other uh, as a function of time. This once upon a time. So you see here, at some stage, you're just producing lots of small particles. And then you make really big particles when you say this P. Then suddenly, whoosh, there's this rain shower coming down. And what you can do then is you can measure what is the angle that stuff is actually coming out. You see it comes out with respect. Then particle density is, is just no particles per frame. And then you can just see the angle is, is, is the blue curve, is the angle. At what angle does it come out? And so what you see is there's two angles. There's zero degrees, which is straight out. But there's also minus 50 and minus 60. So it's really going downward. It's very strongly downward. So what that, by the way, means when you walk outside and you're short, you might want to wear a mask or keep a little longer distance because the particles will fall downward. And so the poor kids, right? They, they're being rained upon by us all the time. And so, so just keep a little more, I mean, of course, if it's your kids, it doesn't matter. But, but if you walk with, a, with somebody who's smaller, just either walk upwind, uh, downwind from that person so that the particles get blown away or make sure you have a longer distance in between because you might just put a lot of particles on this other person. So the taller you are, the better you're off. <laughs> Let's put it this way. And so what you then can do is you can ask yourself, well, what is the volume, right? And so since we were measuring now with, 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 with a mask, we were measuring with holography, we were measuring with particle tracking, we now can make for individual, for, for different things that you do for like singing, shouting, speaking, we can make the full plot. So this is the data that's in the literature. So there's a lot of measurements here. Why is that? Well, because there's a lot of instruments that just measure aerosols. So it's relatively easy. Then out here, you see this is this, this rare data from 
from uh, you know from 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 the Dogate from 1946, for example. This is not 1067, by the way. This is 1967. Okay, so this is not William the Conqueror. Uh, this was really 1967, uh, not that not 1066. Okay, and so what you have is you have here these particles, and you see our our stuff is actually pretty much on top. But what we find is we find modes, so we can actually fit our data to different modes. So we can identify different modes. So we can identify, for example, the lip mode. We can identify something like a tongue mode. There seems to be some Lyrax mode and so on and so on. So this is a data we just writing up. But once you have this volume, so this is the DV, D log D, you plot it that way because it's because of the binning. You want to have a, a, a reasonable way of how to bin the data. And so what we can then do is we can calculate what is the risk of an infection or how many variants per minute would come out on the different activities. And so we can do this and I've done it here. So this is a log plot. So this is 10 to the minus one. Here we have 1,000. And you see there's a, so these are children down here, right? So they have about, what is this? This is about, so this is one. So this is about 0.5, right? But then if you go to, to shouting, right? Or coughing, shouting, coughing, then you're already at 100. So there's many orders of magnitude difference in how many variants is given out at what activity. So speaking quietly is a good thing. Not speaking P's, T's, and so on is also a good thing. And don't shout. Coughing is actually not so bad because you don't cough much. You cough only very brief. And so you have a big dose. But if, if the big dose, if it's not very often. So the room doesn't get enriched in aerosols that quickly. So if you worry about aerosols, because these are mostly aerosols here, what that means is the more dangerous things is shouting and singing. And then speaking loudly, and then it goes down. You also see with age, it goes up. So all of us, it seems. This is from 140 individuals. You can see that we have almost no data on 80 plus. You can see that here. There's, <laughs> we don't have much of a scatter. That's just because we measured only two individuals, right? And so it's not very representative, I would say. But uh, the N is given, of course, in the paper and so on. And then, of course, the loud, the, the, how loud you speak is also matter. So the louder you are, the more particles you put in the air. And this is the the, the, the whole volume of dried aerosols that you put out per cubic centimeters. What is in there? Well, it's, it's not only, of course, the aerosols that come out during the activity, but also the volume you exhale, right? Because this is, of course, it depends on how much air you actually breathe out, right? Because we know how much is in the air, and then we have to calculate what is the volume. So we have to look up the literature and find out what that is. So for example, here, you know, speaking loudly, you see, you have, a, or singing, right? You have to assume how much volume is actually a person giving out. And so then what, the, what, what, what occurred to us was, so the current models use the so-called Wells-Riley formalism. So what the Wells-Riley formalism is, assumes is that, the, that you have a max one variant per particle and the particles are Poisson distributed. And then what you can do is you can calculate, basically you can say that the, you say that the infection risk for an exact pathogen dose of theta you can calculate here, basically it's one minus R, where R is the risk per pathogen and, and theta is the dose. And then you can just do this and then you get a sum by the way, and then you can solve this sum. And what you get then is if it's Poisson distribution, this theta, so the dose is Poisson distribution, then you get this exponential here. So very simple form. It's just like discharging a capacitor, okay? Nothing special. And so what you get is you get one minus R, where, which was the, the infection risk per pathogen times this average dose. And now you can use this little program here. You can calculate the dose and you, know, you basically know the infection risk per pathogen and then you can calculate the probability to get infected. Now, what we realized is that this is all nice and well, as long as it's, there is not more than one pathogen per aerosol droplet. Once you have more than one pathogen per aerosol droplet, you have these two Poisson distributions that you have, they're mixing. And then you have to do a really complicated little bit of math, which I'm not going to, I even cut it off here, I didn't notice, but just scan this, read the paper and tell us where we did it wrong. Okay, this is now also on GitHub, you can download the software, it's going to be in our application. But if you find something, please let me know, okay? Because you know, the referee said, oh, this is statistical physics, it's very hard, but it seems right. So, so you know how it is, right? But it's, it's coming out in plus one, by the way, uh, anytime soon, we are just waiting for the proofs. And the, the good news is if you use that, so this is this paper on archive, uh, the good news is that the multi-pathogen actually has a lower risk 
per infection than a multi-pathogen. And the reason is, it's very, it's unlike, if, if, if multiple pathogens are already in one droplet, then they're missing in the other droplets because you had this concentration and that actually decreases the risk. So naively said, right? But look at the real math. Uh, so Freya, Freya Nordzig and Mosen Bagheri really have done an amazing job. Is Freya, by the way, she has put this all now. This, this is a stiff numerical problem. Once you put these formulas in the computer, you realize you have to go to, to, to the precision of the computer to get a reasonable answer. And you have to make sure you don't trick yourself. You calculate something which is virtual reality. And so she worked very, very hard to solve this stiff numerical problem. And now it's even done online. While you click on our app, you can, this thing will run in the background with Python. And she had to use Fortran in the background because otherwise she couldn't get the compute times so that you could actually compute these complicated formulas and, and this because you have to iterate. So you cannot just do it that way. And so here is the application. Now, here it is in, in uh, Russian. So we have our, our, our thing in uh, the application. So initially what we wanted to do is we wanted to have our data online so that people can download our data. So there's this data view, which is underneath this button here, by the way. And when that was the original idea, but then we realized we can calculate the risk also. And would it be nice for somebody in the public just to try out if I'm in a room, the room is well mixed, what would be the infection risk? So you can do this all with this app. There's a new button now here that's not yet here. That button, the first button even allows you to have different scenarios. You can say, I go in the room, then I stay there for two hours, then I go out of the seminar, I go on a break, I come back. And so you can make different scenarios and put it in with a CSV file, and then it's just iterated. So you can calculate the infection risk yourself. Now the data view will be coming online as soon as we have published our paper on the data, which is very soon submitted. So. And I should say, if you are interested in, in uh, getting the data view, just send me an email and we will probably just open it up for you. Okay, so it's, it's just to make sure that it's not misused. That's why we wanted to keep it behind the fence for a while. But if you, it will become completely public available as soon as the paper is out. That was the idea, open data. That's my principle, our principle. And so this is me testing a mask. I will show this later uh, in, in real life. So, so here you see, by the way, very easy. You need one of these little electric cigarette. Of course, it's not an electric cigarette, it's a special aerosol generator, okay? I was warned in the US, this is bad if I say the cigarette smoke. So this is a specialized smoke generator. And you take this specialized smoke generator and you take one of these, and then you just take it on slow motion and then you get this beautiful stuff. Try it out, it works great, I will show this. And then the question is, what is in a mask? Well, a mask is made like this. So you have an outside shell, you have an inside shell, by the way, this one should have be made out of a cloth that doesn't put too many fibers in your lung. I've measured one mask, which nobody should wear, <laughs> just one, so lucky. But it was so full of fibers, it was unbelievable. It was like, was twice the amount, no, 10 times the amount that's outside in the air came out of the mask in my lung. Right? So that's, they discontinued selling it. So, so then here is this electrode, electrode material, which is a charged material. So this is basically the same material as a, as a Coke, bottle or any other plastic bottle. And it's basically electrospun at about a few thousand volts and it keeps the charge. And why do you have to do that? Well, for big particles, you have inertial effects. So the particles come, they just don't fit through the holes or they just hit the fiber, bang, they suck because of some interaction. For very small particles, you have diffusion. So if the airflow is not too fast and you have enough fibers behind each other, then diffusion will just bring them close to the fiber. And then there's some fond of walls or whatever interaction and they get sucked. But at 300 nanometers, there's a hole. At 300 nanometers, you have neither inertial effects nor diffusion. And so typically these masks have at 300 nanometers a hole and they came up with this ingenious idea to charge the mask and that makes sure that the masks also filter at 300 nanometers. So it's, it's really, and they work really very well. I mean, if I measure a mask like this, for example, this mask here, I just measured, I bought it in China, I measured it. I put in aerosols in my office or I take a bad day outside in Göttingen where there's lots of aerosols, that's good enough too. And then you get in one minute and one liter air, you measure about uh, 200,000 aerosols, okay? And then you put the mask in, and you, you, you clamp it, you, you, you let the air flow through the filter exactly at the test velocity that they use, and then you get zero. Well, that's a good sign that the mask works well. And so we do that. So what I want to show you, so, so this is the, this is a typical filter property of a, of, a, of, a, of a mask, right? So one is FFP2, the other one is a, a poor medical mask, and this is a cloth mask. 
So survival means what, what gets through, right? Not what gets filtered, but what gets through. Now, what you can also measure, you can calculate out of this. And I said this in the, more, uh, in the beginning, this is this ICRP report, which is about human repository tract model for radiological protection. Uh, you might remember the beginning before the audience joined, I told you that there's a big book that actually explained what happens. And then what you can do is you can have for five regions or seven regions, and then you can see where things deposit. And so this is the total deposition, but you could, you even know where, so bronchial, bronchiolar, or extra thoracic, extra thoracic one. So is it the nose? Is it, is it the throat? Where does it go? And so you see also here, you get this 300 nanometer hole, by the way, just the same way the mask has it. And then what you can do is you can say, well, now let's put a mask on and the filtration of the lung. What is finally deposited in the lung? Well, you see that if you wear a FFP2, it's very little. Now you can go even further and you can say, what is the absorbed dose if somebody shouts in your face continuously? So you actually inhale the air of somebody shouting at you. So, so you're giving a kiss through the mask and the person is shouting at you. Okay, so this is a very strange situation, which is unreasonable, but let's play that. And what do you see? The FFP2 mask is really pretty flat. So this FFP2 mask, if you would really breathe through the material, they're very good. So you should not have leaks, but if it's just the pure material, you're really very well protected. It's pure physics, by the way, there's no biology, right? This is pure physics. And so here's a little example of me in the, in the lecture hall, trying to do something to the air. In addition, I'm not able to make a chat. It's impossible. I, I tried really hard. I was coughing. I was whistling even. I was whistling. I said, right? And I tried to make something, nothing happens. And, and by the way, you see again, the air rising around my body very nicely here, right? Okay, so I have a few more minutes. Is that okay? Yes? Yeah, I, I, it's a, it's like, I, I'm sorry, it's a little bit of a long talk, but I just have to get through it. So one thing we did is we wanted to see aerosols. And so now with, if you measure aerosols, the problem is, one good method is to use sodium chloride water vapor, which evaporates and leaves behind sodium chloride crystals. That's the standard test method by, for masks, for example, one of the standard test methods for masks. But what I use is I was just, it's just chalk dust. And you can buy for 180 euros, you can buy two kilograms of test chalk dust. Although I think the chalk dust that we have in our seminar rooms is almost, it doesn't exist almost anymore, but if you find an old sponge, it would be almost as good. But then it's not a certified test staub. And so, so this is, of course, and so what I, what I do here is I make some dust. I show this in this little video. So this is a very good method to make dust. You put, you dump it in there, you make sure it gets distributed and then you just, I was just wiping off the chalkboard. And now suddenly you have, you go from, from, from about uh, 2000 particles per minute in one liter air, you go, to 200,000 particles per one cubic meter, <laughs> per one liter of air. So this way you have basically out, overwritten completely the outside aerosol concentration, completely. So it's really the aerosols you have generated in the room. And then what you hear is the room, it was hundred cubic meters. We had this fan in the window that was blowing air. And so, so this, is my, this is my private air filter that I've designed from a, from a it's very cheap. It's basically from, uh, it's a, a box ventilator who does 7,000 cubic meters per hour. When there's no filter, with filter, it does 4,000 cubic meters per hour. And this is nothing else than this electrified material that you see here that's also in masks. This is a standard bag filter, which is used most likely if you're in your office right now, this is what filters the air that comes from outside or the air if it's recirculated in the system. It's an F9 filter. And F9 filter filter very, very at 400 nanometers. This is the price for this whole thing. I just put it together. Um, by the way, I've done this in my office. I get my office down to this machine to 60 particles per liter. Almost clean room quality in an office with carpet and everything. Well, because this thing puts through it 4,000 liters per hour, <laughs> per, per hour, right? This is a lot of, and my office only has 100 cubic meters. So you have a 40 times air exchange in, the, in, the, in my office. And so we measured this in this, in this, in this, and it's quite, it's not so loud at 2,000, it's fine. And so here, what we do is, so he had put open the windows and what you see, if you put a, if you just, there was a cold day, by the way, and this is just a typical ventilation that in Germany nowadays, we have to open windows in the classrooms. 
And so the, in the cold day, you get about a 15 times air exchange. This agrees completely with things. And of course, it's an exponential process because when you have a lot of aerosols, a lot of dust in the room, of course, it goes down very quickly and later it's diluted. And the more to dilute, the harder it is to exchange the rest out of the material. It's very clear. It has to be an exponential. And so this is the one over E time is about four minutes. And these four minutes, of course, correspond to 15 times air exchange per hour. Just a time constant. Nothing, nothing's uh, worry. Now this is with two windows open and now having the fan on. So if I put a fan in, I could speed it up by a factor of two. So one third, I have about two minutes. So I have a 30 times air exchange. And then I can put on my mixer. It's as good as the, as the, uh, this machine. If I put it on full blast, this is, uh, it, it, I get a, a 50 dBA only that's very quiet. I get also the same time as, as I did with the, with the ventilation. And if I do a rapid filtration, so when I put this thing on full blast, 70 dB, 75 dB, then the one over E time is one minute. So this thing is really efficient. By the way, the way it's blowing off, it's also very nice. I can talk about this later, but the, the fluid dynamics of this thing is also interesting. And so let me just come slowly to an end. And so what is the infection risk? So I told you we have this fancy program. You can go there, you can try it out yourself. I'm sorry, this is in German. I, I did this for Spiegel magazine. And so I, I, uh, I wrote in German and I had to give some German talks, but what's plotted here is the aerosol exchange rate or the air exchange rate per hour, okay? And this is, I call it aerosol exchange rate because I'm not interested if I have a machine that cleans the air, I'm not interested how much air this machine pumps, I'm interested in how many aerosols or how much aerosols this machine is removing. So this is the aerosol removal rate, if you want, per hour. And this is the probability of a kid in a class to get infected. You take 30 kids. I made this very strange teaching. It's 240 minutes continuously. Okay, very unrealistic. You, a teacher usually doesn't teach 240 minutes straight through, but I just try to, to, to get some numbers. I'm a physicist, right? I'm allowed to do these things. And so, and so what I said is, and what is the probability if you repeat the same thing three times in a row and the teacher is infectious and the kids are not, what is the probability that somebody gets infected? At least one person gets infected. And what you see is, <laughs> if you have no air exchange, it's almost 100%. That's bad news, right? So you have to open the windows, that's for sure. But you also see when you go to a five times air exchange, which is by the way, the same as spending every five minutes for every 20 minutes for five minutes, it comes out to be five times, you're still at 60%. So what you can do is you can, of course, for one day, it's only down at, let's say here around 20%, right? So it's still pretty high actually the infection rate. But the good news is you wear a mask and sure enough, you go down in the 1% range relatively quickly. So if you, read, if you take kids, you vent, and you only have to do five times because everything out here doesn't buy anything. It's already at the end of the exponential. Why would you do more, right? It's, it doesn't give you much. It will change it only very little. And so what that means is if you wear a mask, it's very good. And then if you reduce also the number of kids in the class, then it really falls down. So you go to half the kids. So the probability for one person infected, of course, goes down because you have Instead of 15 people that can infect it only, uh, instead of 30, you have 15. And so the probability is very low. And so what is one solution? And then I'm coming to the end. What is one solution to have this air exchange? So one of them is you open the windows every 20 minutes for five minutes. You trust that it's cold outside or you trust that there's a wind blowing against the building and you open, have a window on the other side of the building that you can open. So you have to avoid so called, so the wind then blows from one side of the building to the next, which is very efficient, by the way, because the pressure on the, on the one wall of the building compared to the low pressure on the other side is huge. And so you have this very strong wind going through, but sometimes that's not the case. Then if you open the window and it's kind of warm outside, the temperature in the room is roughly the temperature of outside, well, the window will not do much anymore. There's no thermal forcing. There's no buoyancy involved anymore. So basically air exchange grinds to zero. So you have to keep the window open all the time. And so what do you do if you're a physicist or an engineer? Well, you say, well, who cares? Let's forget nature, let's do it ourselves. And so what you do is you put, you take a glass pane out of the classroom, you put in a plastic, a, a safe fire retardant, whatever material, you put in a fan that shuffles 4,000 cubic meters per hour, you put in a plug, you run it, and now suddenly you open the window and now this fan will suck at full speed, 4,000 cubic meters per hour through the classroom. 
a classroom has 200 cubic meters. So you get a huge air exchange rate if it does perch ventilation, but you don't want that. You have to do this when it's cold outside because you can't heat all this air that you're pumping through this classroom. But when you have a situation where it's warmer, like 10 degrees, 12 degrees, 15 degrees outside, then you can just leave this fan running at about a thousand cubic meters per hour. That gives you a five times air exchange. The fan then is unhearable. It, it's 30 dB. You can actually not hear it. I mean, you have to be quiet. You say, so everybody stop breathing and then you can hear it. You hear a little, <laughs> that's it. And so what that means is with this fan, you can actually do this five times air exchange very quickly. But then the problem is of course, you're pumping a thousand cubic meter of fresh air through the classroom all the time. And so this fresh air might be full of dust, pollen, mosquitoes, who knows, right? Uh, diesel engine, you know, there's a truck outside who just started and you pump all this beautiful dust, diesel dust into the classroom. So actually German DINORM or VDE norm says you have to put an F7 filter, which is a very poor Feinstaub filter for, for dust. And you put that in, you can do this. You can see this, this guy is sucking. These guys are blowing up. You don't have, you shouldn't buy this type of filter because the kids will love it and will tear it down very quickly. So it won't survive for very long. So you get a Z filter and it's protected. And so this is one solution actually. So either the fan alone or this one, and of course the big machine that's sitting in the room. The advantage of this ventilation is there's a clear air pass through the classroom. It's from the one front of the classroom where the windows are open to the back of the classroom or the other way around. And then there's one large circulation. If the heating system is on, you get basically a spiral motion, a helical motion. If, if you don't have that, the kids will making enough thermal turbulence that the room is well mixed. So what that means is this definitely will not lead to a, a short circuited ventilation. This is the one thing why people don't want to use these air cleaners because they can, if you're not careful, they can short circuit on themselves. And so what that means is they make a jet, the jet is mixing, but the jet goes up in the room and from then on it's just boring fluid dynamics. And then it just goes in a circle and makes a little bubble that's very clean but the rest of the room has very little air exchange. And so with this, I would like to, so here's one installation, another installation. So in another classroom uh, where we just put it into the window, we didn't take the class out. And so let me summarize. So I have this complete access to this human aerosol contagion risk through this heads up. Uh, we have extended it to many, many different things. Uh, we are working on a, a version that also works outdoors because we want to put a a jet, turbulent jet basically in and say uh, for about two, three meters, that's pretty reliable. Uh, yeah, they can be done relatively well. Then these F9 filters actually filter. And I didn't get to the point that playing music instruments and singing can be possible if you wear a mask. But I think this is kind of trivial to say. I mean, you're all physicists and scientists and you know this. And with this, I'm closing and I have a demo for you, which I would now come because Uli asked me especially for this demo. So I give you now one demo. So I stop this. Um, let me just stop this. Um, how do I stop the share? Oh, I should go on. This is the team. So Mosen Bagheri is the lead scientist. He's the group leader who's working with me on this. These are all nice scientists who work very, very hard on this. Laura Turco is now working at Bayer. She was supposed to work in Switzerland, but it didn't work out because she can't get across the border. So she's now stuck in Germany and works for Bayer and is a trainee. Oli is a, a metrologist. Freya is my, uh, she's really a computer, I mean, computer freak. She's really very, very good. Jan Molacek is doing these Zugspitz experiments and Katja is an undergrad student. Then Simone Scheidhauer from the University of Medicine, because for all this, you always need a medical doctor who tells you the truth. We physicists tend to go a little overboard once, some, once in a while, and then it's good to get the realism of medic, medicine back. And then there's Mira Pöke, who is an atmospheric scientist and her husband. And there's this other group that we're working with. So there's a large group of people working together. Uh, Oliver's doing these experiments at Bessie too, uh, where he's doing these scattering experiments. And so this is the group. And with this, I would like to thank everybody. Now I stop my presentation and do the demo and I have to stop screen share. So here we are. So now I do my presentation. And so uh, I wanted to do a few tests. So this is my smoke generator, okay? And so I show you that it works. It seems to work, right? Okay, so this is test number one, okay? Now we wear, we put a mask on, like let's put this mask, oh God, the smoke here, I have to open the, 
I open the windows so not that the fire alarm goes on. I should also mention, uh, I should mention I have taken precautions that I have a well mixed room. I show this to you now, so don't be scared when it suddenly moves. Uh, where is it? Here, 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 here. This is what I was putting in my office the, basically a few weeks after the pandemic started because I realized having the virus mixed over the largest volume possible is a good thing. And so I put all of these fans in. Since then, it's running almost continuously. I started to like it actually a lot because this kind of motion is kind of nice. And so here we are. So this is my thing. So what I do is I, I now put the mask on. OK. I, I make it leak tight. Actually, I glue mine up here with some double sticky tape. But let's put this on. Now I breathe in, OK? Did, did you see anything? Ah, exactly. That's a good mask. And you don't need a 15,000 euro instrument to do that. 16 euros, do it completely. Really, you can do this. I, I've shown this to the family. They actually, the kids have, it's probably not so good to let them smoke, but uh, it, it, there's nothing in it, right? This is just this funny liquid, right? And so they tried it at home and they did what I did. So, so what they did is they, for example, they have these great masks, right? They have this polyurethane on top. Now, any physicist who knows how to how do these things work knows that this polyurethane that's an FFP2 mask, but three, they also have polyurethane and they have this little sticker in the back, but I don't need it. You would say, why would anybody in its sane mind of affairs put a open cell polyurethane foam in a mask? Well, because they want a controlled leak. They want you that you breathe out the stuff up here, but slowly. So let me show you. So I put this on. So this is actually a good mask. I mean, it's very nice. It breathes very easily, especially on exhalation. You will see in a moment why. It's very good on exhalation. It's on inhalation is a little deep, but let me show you. So, so up here is this polyurethane foam. So I repeat, polyurethane foam. It's basically a designed leak. So, so what that means is anybody who has a mask like this with this funny open cell polyurethane foam in it has this leak. It's designed. It's by design. It's not, it's not because the foam, of course, I mean, if you build a filter, you want small pores. But this desert like open foam is open, right? <laughs> and so if you take a, a mask from a really good manufacturer, they have a closed cell foam. They don't use open cell foams. What they know is nothing. You're better off with nothing. And then since I do tests for the clinic, you know, here's a mask, which I tested this. If you see this red line here, this is now my demo mask. So Uli has seen this one before. So this one was called a VIP mask. Very, well, probably very important person mask, right? It's FFP2. EN has a, has a test code too. I put it on. I said, wow, this is the best mask I've ever had. No air resistance whatsoever. It breathes like a charm. Of course, it's a VIP mask because they've, they've somehow invented a material which is really leak tight. It's unbelievable. No air resistance whatsoever. It's fantastic. So let me show you. So, and then I said, what the heck? What's going on? And so what I did is I cut this thing open and I looked to find the magic fleece, right? This nice, very soft material. There's nothing. This mask has no filter. And so it's, it's worse than a cloth mask. It's much worse than a cloth mask. So a bamboo mask is. So just a t-shirt is better than this. And so you see, you, you have to be a little careful of what you use, okay? And so what I suggest is, uh, if those of you who don't trust the mask, do the little smoke test or just take scissors and cut it open and you will find inside of this mask, you find this one thin layer where you can see immediately that this is the electret, it's melt spawn. It has very long fibers and it's completely electrostatic. It folds almost on top of itself. It's unbelievable. It's very strange material to fold. With this, I close and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot for this uh, nice talk and uh... 
those nice presentations. Um, let's see the first questions coming up. So I remind that please ask your questions via the Q&A. There's one in the chat. One in the chat. What did you find out about ah, wind okay. So wind instruments? Okay. okay, so what we have done is the following. We have measured uh, wind instruments are like singing, a little more than singing in terms of aerosol uh, in, out, output. Uh, there's no big droplets coming out of trumpets and, and other instruments. Very rare that a droplet is coming. So the big droplets are missing. But there's a lot of small droplets and aerosols. But the advantage is if you take one of these uh, uh, F9 filters and you put it over the trumpet, you can actually reduce this down to less than speaking, breathing. Factor 10 less than, than breathing. So the problem is when you just put it on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, you know, on the, what is it called? Trichter. Um, you know, if you just put it on the oh. trumpet like this with a rubber band, right? Oh, no. On the horn, the problem is that you change the acoustics. It's hard to play the trumpet because you change the resonances. And so we have now designed a different design where we go out and we do some 3D printing and we are, trying, we are getting very close to actually have a reusable filter. And with our measurements, we got, we got uh, in one German state, they allowed to teach children again, one-on-one. -on -one because they're using these filters. So if the teacher has a mask, they open the windows and the trumpet or the, the, the wind instrument has a filter on top of it, if it's a horn, then it's okay. What can you do when you have a saxophone or a clarinet or a flute? Well, what you do is you have to put a whole bag around it. It works also. Uh, professional players don't have to see their hands. They are quite happy to not see their hands and they can play. It doesn't look a little funny because there's this big gigantic bag but it works. And so we are making progress. We actually want to plan a research project where we actually want to come out with a product with a with the Musikverein, not Rhine this fun, Blas Musikverein. We are working with them on, we have a lot of volunteers coming in to actually do tests and see how we can actually play, make it safe again to play music instruments, basically. It can be done. I'm very optimistic, very optimistic. Okay, thanks. So we have another question. Uh, what is about the effectiveness about masks outside in the wild compared to the lab? And uh... Okay, so, so what we know is that these masks don't lose their charge uh, easily. So if you don't cook them or put them in isopropanol, um, they don't lose the mask. You can, uh, you can heat them up to 80 degrees Celsius and then the virus is surely dead. So there's an investigation from Münster where they have looked at that. I, I don't quite believe what they're saying, but they say this, this virus might stay inside the mask active for eight days, which but what they suggest is just take a new mask every day and you're fine. I mean, it's not a problem. Um, so we know the electrode is very robust. It survives for a long time. Um, I even have cooked one once. You know, I gave it to one of my employees. They went home and they cooked it with 80 degrees. We have autoclaved the masks once. They were still 80% filters, even after one autoclave cycle. So they're extremely robust, these electrode filters. They are very robust. So in the wild, the main thing is really to keep uh, the, the to, to make them leak tight, always. And so if you find a way of making them less leaky, so there's, there's multiple ways. So the one way is you take a mask that has this form, this kind of shape. This kind of shape has the big advantage that it has a much larger surface area. And when you breathe in, it doesn't collapse on itself. The problem with these masks is when you breathe in, they collapse like this. And this way, the active surface area decreases. And then it feels like you're suffocating, especially when you breathe in fast. It's basically like a valve that's closing on you, which you don't have with these type of masks. So the masks that are open to the front, you don't have the same problem. So they are much easier to wear. They are not as exhausting. Uh, what I also do is I use, uh, I can, I come back in a sec. Uh, So, so 3M sells uh, medical tape, which I have here. So this is sticky tape for the medical, you know, this is sticky service. By the way, it's great for the lab too, because you can stick all kinds of stuff to everything. It's also oil resistant, so it's really nice. Um, and so what I do is I cut, as you can see, is I cut a little, uh, let me show. So I cut a little strip of this. It's double sticky tape. And then I glue it. So this mask, you can't, you can't see it. This mask has a little bit of glue on the top here. And so I glue it there and then suddenly I can walk around without my mask ever slipping down over the nose, without my eye, without my glasses fogging up. It's, it's a completely different life. I mean, and I've been doing it now for months and you can see my skin looks still okay. 
So this is just like, and it's, it's called 3M. The one that works best is 15, uh, 1509, I think, because it sticks well to the mask. But it turns out 1509 is a hard time. You can't get it in Germany. You get 1522 is standard. But 1509, you can buy it in Switzerland. So if somebody wants to buy some 1509, they have 160 meters somewhere in Switzerland of it. But it works actually quite well. So yes. Okay. I saw Mark raise the hand. Yeah, I'll uh, um, I'll speak to you instead of Uli uh, uh, translating. Um, so Eberhard, thank you. That was very, very interesting and very, of course, very timely and topical. Um, I was, was very interested to see, uh, in fact, you've explained some of the decisions that we've seen taken in France here, uh, about 50% occupation of classes. Um, also understanding uh, and Angela Merkel's uh, insistence on airing, uh, ventilating rooms and so on. Yeah, we so, just, let me just, uh, so let me, surely that, sorry that I interrupt. We just wrote a recommendation for with the Umwelt Bundesamt for theaters, which I was part of the committee. So we recommend an air exchange of about 60 cubic meters per hour per person in a theater and half occupancy. Right. And then the risk is really low that you get an infection. If you wear masks, you have to wear these masks. That's, that's the only, and so eating is really difficult. And, <laughs> and in Göttingen, I know most of the infections that are being traced are coming out of situations where people have had a coffee together or they were eating together. Most of the infections. So, so, so actually, you, you've, you've, I think you've almost answered my question. It was, um, how is your work informing uh, public health uh, uh, policy and, 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 and uh, response to the current situation? Uh, so you've just said it for theatres. I mean, uh, are the public health authorities in close uh, consultation with you and other people like you who are doing yes, this kind yes, of research? Yes, they are. So they are in very close. So, so you know, perhaps uh, Viola Prisimon is also at our institute. She has informed from the beginning with SIR modeling about the risk. She has been on this little circle that Merkley had, right? There was the, Mer there was the, the first meeting was a, a, a group of four or five that advised from Merkley. And so she, they are listening very carefully to the scientists. Uh, of course, under the scientists, there's always a little disagreement, right? So like the, the, the engineers uh, believe very strongly in opening windows. And of course the politics will like, likes to hear that because opening windows is so easy, right? You don't have to install anything. You can just keep going, right? As you always did. Um, so they listen, no, there's a lot, it's actually very easy. So I've been, I've been on this committee recently for this Umwelt Bundesamt for the, for the uh, you know, for the theaters and so on and so on. Then I'm on a, on a committee for a UVC. So the question is, can you clean air with uh, ultraviolet rays, UVC rays? Uh, this is a very tricky question, to be honest. There's no, there's no norm, it turns out, there's nothing. Um, the, the one thing that I'm nervous about is not that it doesn't filter. I think it's great. The question is, how many mutants do I produce if I'm not careful? This is the, the that's the tricky part, and we I'm in this committee too because I also do biophysics, and uh, Uli didn't say that, but I half of my life is biophysics and and, and 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 synthetic biology and stuff like that, and so and so I think this is very important to look at these filtration systems and also a lot of, so we are, we are, let's say the parents want technically filtration or technically ventilation of the classrooms. Clearly, I mean the parents want mostly want like cleaners, air cleaners, although I'm personally not so much a big fan of them because they tend to recirculate on each other. And in the summer, when it gets hot, you don't want to put another kilowatt in your room. You just don't want to do that. I mean, it's already 27 degrees in the classroom and then you put a, a, your, your bathroom heater in the, the corner and heat the glass bathroom with another kilowatt. And, and this pandemic will not be over in the summer. It just won't be over. So, so it, it, it's short-sighted to, to now not make a plan for the summer. I think we should now make plans. Good summer, we have summer vacation, so it will be okay. <laughs> but, but I think it would be, make sense to think about the hot days that are ahead of us. I mean, hot in sense of outside temperature, not politics. And, 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 and just quickly, at the, at the other end of the process, so that's the end of the process where your research is being used. Um, has, has, have, have these government bodies... Uh, funded your research recently to allow you to make these uh, very impressive developments over the last. Uh, so, so this is a very months. interesting. This is a very interesting story. Um, getting funds is very hard. 
So I, together with Fry Scheidhauer, who's my colleague from the University of Medicine, we have now spent over a million euros already on this. If I take the personnel costs and everything, because I basically dropped doing cloud physics and have started to do with four postdocs continuously, only aerosols, nothing else. And so, so uh, slowly things are trickling in. So I have a, I get some money through the University Medicine project on aerosols. I'm the, if you know the German system, it's called the Z project, which is the technology project. So I'm at part of the technology project. I have a proposal in for measuring aerosols. The German Science Foundation just had a call on aerosols. And what they have done is you, it's very nice. What they have done is they've done two things. First of all, the proposal is only five pages which is good. So you don't have to write a long, long drawn out thing. It's also difficult because you have to make sure that in five pages, you can say what you want to say. Um, the other thing is they made, as you know, my, you might know in Germany, Max Planck directors don't have the right to apply for DFG funds or Fraunhofer or Helmholtz. In this case, we are allowed to apply as a single investigator. So good. this means if you are from a national lab, suddenly you can apply. And so this is good news in some sense. So they, they really have set up some money. Of course, the competition for these things, I can tell you, I've applied for a Volkswagen grant, okay? I didn't get it. The Volkswagen grant was in May last year. They thought we get a few submissions. They got 1,100 submissions and they funded 110. <laughs> and so you can imagine, right? I mean, how hard it is. You, you know where they told me that I don't get the money? In January this yeah. year. Yeah. And but I asked my president to pre-finance. And I said, Dear President, if I don't get the money, can I get at least, you know, two-thirds of the money that I would have gotten from Volkswagen? And he said yes. So I was lucky. I actually got my two-thirds of money without actually having to report to the Volkswagen Foundation. So I'm quite happy. <laughs> but this well is done. Fun, Thank right? you. This is... Yeah. Thank you. Uli, we don't hear you. Now, you yeah. So we have one more technical question, which is, uh, is the value of relative humidity of the saliva droplets uh, in equilibrium known? Which means how high would yes, be Yes, so the what, what if, you, if, you, if you take the review, by the way, if you, if you download this review, there's a whole chapter on this. Uh, there's also a chapter on rehydration. So for example, if, if you get, you know, when you... For example, something that I hadn't appreciated before I was working on aerosols is when you, when you go outside, it's cold outside and humid, you see your breath. Actually, you see your breath, that's the point. You're not seeing what, what's, what's nucleating the air or the droplets, they're nucleating on your own aerosols. I'm pretty sure they don't nucleate on the outside aerosols, they nucleate on your own aerosols. Because you basically go out, the cold air mixes the air, the air is high humid, but there are nucleation sites, namely your own aerosols, and they just keep growing. And so you probably, I want to investigate this a little bit more thoroughly because I always thought, well, it's the aerosols from outside that make it, but it's probably your own aerosols. You, you, you just produce your own. So it's really, you see your own breath. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and so, so uh, yes, it's very important because on the intake, when you inhale, I try to say this in my talk, of course, these droplets will suddenly see 100% humidity. And then you have a curler curve. And so then these things basically, because of surface tension, you know, they, the, the growth is limited because of surface tension, depending on the size of the, of the droplet, but you also have it, you know, so it tries to catch up with the equilibrium, so to speak, right? And so it's just starting to grow. And if you are above hundred percent, you get even a runaway effect and you get cloud drops, right? And so, so it's really cloud physics in the lung. It's just good old cloud physics, it's nothing else. And so the person who calculated this in the review is a cloud physicist. This is what he usually does. He calculates nucleation and growth of cloud droplets around uh, cloud nucleation sites. As, as you might know, the, 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 the nucleation of clouds is all heterogeneous. There is no homogeneous nucleation. It's all heterogeneous. Okay, so I don't see any external questions anymore. So I want to reiterate our invitation that uh, one day you should catch up the visit of our site. I would and love to see it actually, to be honest. You can get some new ideas where you can extend towards even smaller droplets with suns and sucks where we have very nice instruments to complement. That's what, what I was wondering. Done. You know, you might want to talk to, to actually to, to uh, Christopher Pölker, mm -hmm. but he does it best. He sounds very much. We could do this also somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and catching these aerosols with an impactor is not so hard to be actually. You, you run it through a dryer and then you impact it on the surface and then you can localize very well where they are. 
And then you can do all these nice, wonderful scattering experiments from it and see what's inside. And, and it, one of the big questions, where's the virus? Most likely it's inside caught in some kind of matrix of material. It's really on the outside. This is what currently the, the measurements show with surrogate particles, not with actual viruses. By the way, you might even see the virus directly. So it's very, very interesting. Uh, so basically hardcore, should I say physics to, to really look at these things. And, and the one thing we are excited about is, uh, so we just submitted what, 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 what we really like is we think you are able to say where these particles came from. Possibly. This is now I'm giving away the little things that we're doing. I'm just producing some competition for myself, but why not? You know, we all think of the same stuff. But, but it might be possible to know where these particles are. Why is this also important? The in and out is very important because for the in, if you give medication, you need to know where they go. And so if you go, of course, go in and out, you could actually see where they went. You see what I'm saying? So there's, so it's, it's, it's quite an amazing, uh, amazing, interesting medical problem. It has nothing to do with pandemics. It's just if you have an asthma and you have a spray, you would like to know where does it go? What particle size do I have to get so that it goes really where the medical people want it to be? And I think we have a chance with these machines that you all have to really see where these things came from with these analytical tools that are now available and just shoot them at these, at these more biological substances. And, and so this is what Christopher has been doing for outside aerosols, bioaerosols. And so he's usually sampling bioaerosols in the atmosphere and then goes to BESI-2 and makes measurements with, with X-ray, X -ray, soft X-rays and X-rays. So very good, very good. I will okay. come by, cool. I'd, I'd really love to come by. Excellent. And I hope you had a little bit of fun and I, have, I wish you a nice Friday. Thank you too. <laughs> a nice weekend. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank so you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.